Hey, and welcome to the second short lecture from Chapter 6 in your textbook. And in this short lecture, we're going to talk about the, the two approaches to the cultural perspective uh, of organizational communication, the pragmatist and purist approach. Starting with the pragmatist approach. Uh, the, the pragmatist approach uh, looks at culture as, as variable. Uh, so uh, managers are, are interested in measuring how uh, one feature of the organization, specifically the culture, affects the larger organization. So uh, as a result, right, cultural pragmatists uh, view uh, culture as variable, and, and, they, and they look at it as something that can be changed to influence or uh, uh, improve uh, the organization, right? So, so the idea here is that if culture is variable, you can change it. And so cultural pragmatists say, okay, let's, let's go in, take a look at the, the, the culture of your organization and see how we can change it, specifically change it to improve performance, to increase profitability, etc. right? So the idea is that you can create or change a, a corporate culture or an organizational culture and, and use that variability to achieve your goals. So generally, they, they put this responsibility for engineering a, an organizational culture uh, in the hands of the manager. So the manager is responsible for, for creating the culture, for changing the culture if it needs to be changed, and, and using the culture to, to generate efficiency, profitability, efficacy, etc. So uh, if you're a good manager, you can manipulate and, and build the kind of culture in your organization that you want. And, and uh, culture in and of itself is, is a means by which an end, i.e. profitability, uh, is reached, right? So it doesn't have to be profitability. You could be involved in a, in a non-profit organization, for example, and if you build the kind of, like the Red Cross, if, if you, uh, a, a pragmatist would look at the Red Cross and say, okay, how can we build a, an organizational culture at the Red Cross to help the most people, right? Uh, and, and the idea, again, is that organizational culture is variable and can be changed. So, according to this approach, the pragmatists uh, sort of assume that successful organizations have a single culture that everyone buys into. And this is what we call an integration approach to culture. So according to this, uh, in a perfect world, all the organization members are all brought in to uh, share a single worldview and, and share a set of values that guide their behavior and decision making. So, um, you know, oftentimes we, we look at a, at a large organization. We can look at uh, Gordon State, for example, and see that Gordon State is really made up of a bunch of different cultures, just the same way high school is, right? I mean, you, high school should be uh, something you can relate to, right? So there's the jocks, there's the, the, the geeks, there's the, the band people, there, right? There, there are all these, the goths, uh, the metalheads, right? There are all these different groups, there are all these different cultures within one culture. But according to the pragmatist approach, they'd look at that and say, don't, you know, don't think about these independent cultures or these subcultures you know, if you want a successful school, everybody has to buy into one school culture and all be oriented uh, towards towards a goal, right? You all have to share the same values. And when you share these values, if you really internalize them, if, if you really believe in them, then, then we can count on you to act in the best interest of the organization, right? And, and we don't even really have to supervise you. All we have to do is have you buy in 100% into our, our culture and, and our, our values, right? So this, this approach uh, would be characterized as strongly prescriptive, which is to say that cultural pragmatists aren't shy about telling people how to create these kinds of functional structures, right? Um, a classic example of this is, is a book that's very well known in organizational communication and the business world in general called In Search of Excellence, uh, written by Peters and Waterman. And in it, they, they tell you exactly how to achieve this kind of uh, uh, single unitary culture uh, have your employees buy into the, the values of the organization uh, so that they all uh, work towards these, these common goals uh, in, in ways that are sort of innate. And uh, uh, it's just built into you, right? So you're naturally going to do the right thing for the organization. 
So the, the pragmatic approach then adopts a functionalist or, orientation. Uh, so culture has very specific functions then within the organization. It creates a, a shared identity, right? Everybody's part of the organization, and, and that's, that's how they identify. Uh, it generates employee commitment to the organization. It enhances organizational stability. And ultimately, this culture can act as a sense-making device, right? So if you form a really effective, according to this pragmatist approach, if you form a really good uh, vision of a corporate culture, then employees uh, use this, this sense of culture and the values uh, in their everyday life. They become taken for granted kind of norms, right? It's just the way you see the world. You see the world the Gordon State way or the Coca-Cola way or the, the, the Georgia State way or what, what have you, right? Uh, so, so the idea is then these values help you make sense of the rest of the world. You see everything through this lens and, and it provides you with a way for, for making sense of your everyday life, right? Not just in the organization, outside it as well, right? So that's the pragmatic approach. Now, when we talk about the purist approach, culture is not something an organization has. Instead, they think of the organization as being a culture. Right? An organization is culture. So, so there's a difference here. Right? If a pragmatist thinks that, that an organization can uh, create a culture, the purist is saying, no, 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 the organization is already a culture. It is a culture. Right? And culture works as a basic framing device to shape our sense of organizational reality. Right? So when you enter into an organization, that organization is itself a culture, and, and being in that culture is acts uh, as a framing device, as a way of seeing the world, as a lens that shapes your idea of organizational reality, of your reality within the organization. Now the purists also maintain that organizations only exist to the extent that members engage in communicative practices, right? So, so this, is, this goes back to that, that notion at the, the beginning of the lecture where we talked about how uh, we can argue that an organization isn't an objective thing. Instead, it's behaviors. It's communicative behaviors. Right? It's people getting together, interacting, communicating, and that makes up the organization. Right? They also argue against the idea that you can manipulate an organizational culture to meet the needs and the goals of the organization, right? They don't believe in the idea of forming a strong corporate culture that can make you more productive, right? They don't, they don't see culture as something uh, that, that should be or could be created and manipulated in that way, right? They, they think that's just artificial. So purists argue against cultural management uh, as an approach uh, for, for a number of reasons. The, the first one is that they argue that organizational culture evolves spontaneously. Right? It, 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 it's just created uh, uh, out of nothing right? <laughs> to a certain extent. It, it just sort of emerges out of, out of people's behaviors. It isn't something that, that's, that's planned. It's something that evolves, and it evolves according to needs and experiences. They also argue that organizational culture is so complex that you can't really establish causal connections between culture and performance. Right? So, so they're going to say to the pragmatist, look, you can't possibly understand this culture uh, and manipulate it to, to create a better performance or a more profitable organization because culture is far too complex to be manipulated in that way. Right? Um, so if you've ever been confronted with a, a rah-rah speech from an employer or an organization uh, where they're like, you know, we're going to create a culture of this and it's going to be awesome, and you're like, oh, that's a bunch of bullshit, right? Uh, that right there is proof that organizations are really complex, and, and it's, it is incredibly difficult, if not impossible, to really create a culture in the way that at least the, the, the pragmatists think that you can. So tied in with this, of course, is the idea that organizations don't have a single culture, but instead they have a bunch of competing subcultures, right? Just like in the high school we talked about, the geeks, the the, the, the band, uh, band people, the jocks, the goths, the metalheads, right? These are all different groups who, who are uh, essentially subcultures, right? And oftentimes have competing interests. So, 
because you have all these different subcultures within an organization, the interpretation of the organization's rituals, slogans, sayings, etc., uh, can, can vary dramatically according to which group is doing the interpreting, right? So maybe the jocks really do believe all the stuff that they tell them about how great the school is, but the nerds are, think that it sucks, and, and they think the principal's speech is a bunch of bullshit, right? That, that shows you, right, that's typical, that kind of understanding that there's going to be uh, resistant readings, there's going to be positive readings, there's going to be dominant readings of the messages of the organization. Uh, that's the, the purists recognize that that goes on all the time. The pragmatist says, uh, no, you know, uh, if, if someone rejects the, the cultural message of the organization, uh, that's because the managers aren't doing their job right. So uh, for the purist, the attempts to manage an organizational culture uh, really is just about uh, trying to manipulate employees' feelings in, in ways that are deeply uh, unethical. Right? The bottom line is that uh, not only is it ineffective to try and create a culture and manipulate your employees' feelings and beliefs uh, in line with this, uh, it, it's not just uh, impractical, it's, it's unethical to do so. So, uh, pragmatists, uh, their studies usually focus on, on, on corporate organizations, which shouldn't be surprising, right? Because corporate organizations are about making money and pragmatists are about creating cultures that... that uh, breed efficiency and productivity. Uh, purists, on the other hand, uh, look at all different kinds of organizations, from, from strip clubs, right? There have, been, uh, there have been any number of academic studies of, of adult businesses, for example, that have taken a, a purist perspective, uh, to fraternities, to businesses, right, what have you. The, 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 the scope of the purist approach is much wider in terms of what they, what they study. Now, uh, cultural purists generally are disinterested in relationships between culture and organizational competitiveness. So, so uh, really, they want to examine organizational culture more broadly. They want to look at it like anthropologists. They aren't interested in organizations for the sake of, you know, how can we sell more Pepsi than they sell Coke, right? Uh, they're more interested in just the organization for the organization's sake, as a culture and just studying it because there's value in, in understanding that communication system. They're not necessarily looking to make it more competitive in a marketplace or more efficient. They just want to understand it. Uh, so as a result, the purists uh, employ what are called ethnographic methods. And, and these ethnographic methods come out of anthropology. You probably heard of ethnography before. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, there's a lot of research uh, that employs what we call uh, qualitative or field-based methods to develop thick descriptions of organizational culture. So, so what this means, um, you know, they're doing research uh, like ethnographies where they go and they insert themselves in the corporate culture, study how people behave, study how they interact, study their rituals, study their communication, and then write really detailed, critical descriptions, right? And not, not critical in the sense of negative, but critical in, in the sense of really uh, getting into the nitty-gritty and examining what's going on and describing what's going on, right? Um, so, th so they try and, again, do these ethnographic-style studies uh, where they might immerse themselves in an organizational culture for months or even years, to study the naturally occurring everyday behavior. So um, the role of the researcher in, in these situations can vary. They can, they can just try and be an everyday uh, observer, right? They can try to be a participant as observer. So, uh, you know, you, you participate in what's going on. You're just not standing to the side and watching it. Um, they can be complete participants. Uh, where, where they're actually part of that organization, and, and that's how their, their study began. So, so they're, they buy into it, you know, they're, they're, they're totally ensconced in it, they grew up in it, they, they, they already lived there, and now are studying it, right? They're, they're all different things that, that we can, or all different ways that, that we can observe, right? But I suggest to you, <clears throat> you know, I ask you here at the bottom, is the problem with some of these roles? And I, I think... Uh, the answer is, of course, that any time uh, we observe something, 
we change it. Right? Anytime we observe a behavior, we change it. And, and that's the argument against all forms of ethnography, not just a purist approach to organizational uh, ethnography. It's anytime you, you try and insert yourself in a culture and observe it, the culture around you changes. You know, you, you behave differently when you're in private than you do when you're in public, and that's because people could be watching you, right? And, and so the argument is that you never get a, a truly, uh, uh, how can I phrase this? You never get a true vision of naturally occurring behavior in these organizations because just watching something changes it, right? All right, so that's it for this short lecture. There'll be one more, uh, but uh, thank you for checking this one out.